स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया morning we continue our discussion of uh, the french masters today we are focusing on robert bresson but before that i'll just try to recap what we have been doing so far characteristics of uh, the french nouvelle vogue or the french new wave so we know that uh, the masters we were discussing renoir the other day and they believed in casting non professional non trained actors to get a, 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 a kind of performance which was low on melodrama so that was one thing they uh, uh, the practitioners of uh, uh, the, the french nouvelle vogue as uh, uh, there was a group and we have already seen led by the critic andre bezon who established a journal called cahier du cinema and these film makers rejected the cinematic practices of the 1950s truffaut francois truffaut even went so far as writing an essay uh, and it's a, uh, it's a watershed kind of a piece called a uh, cer certain quality of french cinema okay and what is that certain quality or certain tendency of french cinema and what is that focusing on big budget and big star cast films basically based on uh, these uh, uh, french classics okay and when you may uh, adapt a novel into film then all the problems that accompany you have to cast big stars you have to have big um, sets you have to have uh, the uh, backing of a big studio and that's what truffaut means by uh, a certain tendency a certain quality of french cinema and these people the nouveau vogue directors they rejected these practices of the 50s they believed in making low budget films we have already talked about that using handheld camera and shooting on locations they came out of the shackles of the studio so real locations real people and of course preferred natural light to studio lighting natural sound to extensive studio dubbing we have seen all this now um, uh, we are talking about a period remember rules of the game was made in 1939 and uh, we are talking about a period of that is a uh, second world war and this was a time when american films were not screened in france remember there was a part of france which is called the occupied france occupied by who good the nazis germany germans okay so american cinema because america was supposedly the enemy and films were the, their uh, movies were not shown screened in france now immediately after the war there was a huge demand for hollywood products and some of the much appreciated films included film noirs such as the maltese falcon starring humphrey bogart double indemnity this is a billy wilder movie and laura okay so uh, the uh, otto preminger movie so these were they belong to the category of film noir so this uh, term also was coined by the french critics noir and these critics apart from being impressed by authors like hitchcock and howard hawks they also uh, admired the techniques which orson welles introduced and perfected in citizen kane which was made in 1941 so the french cinephiles the film critics they recognized that a major revolution is taking place which uh, french cinema is unaware of and they recognize that it's a key event in hollywood it's a key period in hollywood that's going on um uh, film noir the so called film noir most of them were based on novels by 
pulp novels as we were talking about yesterday. James Kane, we talked about Mildred Pierce. Remember James M. Kane, Postman Always Rings Twice and Mildred Pierce. Raymond Chandler, what did he write? A great okay. movie based on his very popular pulp novel. The Big Sleep. Directed by Howard Hawks. We were talking about Howard Hawks. Starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. So, Dashiell Hammett, who wrote The Maltese Falcon, Raymond Chandler, James Ken, and their kind of uh, heroes, their kind of plots. So, the Hollywood film Noah combined the hard boiled prose of uh, these writers, the Noah writers with European expressionist cinematography. And all these uh, uh, immensely appeal to the Kyer critics. Now, see Noah and the hard boiled hero, they were uh, extremely popular with the French uh, filmmakers and French critics. Does anyone remember that key scene from Godard's Breathless, which is often considered as a homage uh, to film noir? Do you remember Azar? Have you watched the uh, Breathless? Is there any moment where? Uh, oh no, that is from Patal, all right. But a direct reference to film Noah of Hollywood. Is there anything, any shot which you remember? Does anyone? You do you remember? No? Okay. Um, hero, the great Jean Paul Belmondo. Okay. He play, plays a very grey character, morally ambiguous character in Breathless. And um, his signature style is he wears all those uh, uh, very stylish tailored suits. He wears that hat and he is always smoking a cigarette. Hmm. Now, uh, there is a point when he comes face to face with a poster of Humphrey Bogart and the poster is from harder they, the harder they fall. Hmm. It is a film noir and he just you know the look in Jean Paul Belmondo's eyes like pure worship. He is looking at his hero, which he wants to become, because it is very clear. So, that is Godard paying homage to film noir. Okay, so, we have already talked about other features, uh, employment of light weight cameras. Why do we need light cameras as opposed exactly handheld, which can be used to shoot on actual locations, actually streets and lights and sound and all these equipments allowed the new wave directors to shoot in the Parisian cities rather uh, and streets rather than in studios. The fluid camera motion, you understand can anyone tell me what is a fluid camera motion as opposed to static camera. So, the camera is moving like in a tracking shot. Exactly, camera tracks. You know, we were talking about Max Ophels and we talked about pan, camera panning the entire scenario. And then we have the fluid shots of Godard. There is a, a particular a scene. Yeah. Godard was once married to this beautiful actress Anna Karina, not Anna Karenina, that is Leo Tolstoy. Anna Karina, you remember? Okay. So, um, they made a movie together. Mm. I cannot remember the name, title of the film, where she enters a music shop, you know shops which sell music records and etcetera, not CDs those days, but uh, records. And she enters a shop and she says, I want something by Judy Garland, Judy Garland, Wizard of Oz. She was also a songstress, a singer, okay. so she is looking for some music by Judy Garland. And the camera just tracks Anna Karina across the shop as she looks for Judy Garland on the shelves. And then 
she get, finds her record and she comes back and pays for it. Yeah. So, the camera follows her throughout the freedom of movement, freedom of camera. So, that is what we understand by fluidity of camera motion. And this is a, uh, you know camera is never still. And when you watch a movie like Mean Streets for example, which we will soon be discussing after once we, once we fil finish Hollywood, uh, French New Wave, then we will be stepping into that area also. And Scorsese is Mean Streets, camera is never static, handheld camera, right? Have, has anyone watched Mean Streets here? How many of you have watched Mean Streets? No? I am surprised. Okay. We will do that soon then. Okay. Mean Streets is, is, is a textbook. Okay. I know you, you know all the greats by Martin Scorsese, good fellas onwards. Okay. So, I think that was the year uh, when most of you were born. Am I right? Good fellas is 89. Yeah. So, around that period. <laughs> okay. So, um, coffee shops, coffee bars, Paris is known for its coffee shops, right? All those intellectual discussions, Jean Paul Sartre and Camus having, we know those existentialist writers. So, uh, um, uh, the mises of Parisian streets and coffee bars became a defining features of all these films. Actors sitting, having tea, uh, coffee, uh, sorry not tea, coffee in coffee bars on Parisian streets okay. and handheld lightweight cameras gave the directors that sort kind of freedom to shoot on actual locations, which is that most recent movie by uh, Mani Ratnam. I get Kadal. that impression. Kadal. 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 Okay. Has, has anyone watched it? How is it? Yeah, tell us why it is not good. I mean Mani Ratnam is supposedly one of the pioneers of new. It's a routine story ma'am, it's just good business evil, nothing like it's not uh, Alai Paide or uh, Bombay level. Mm. It's just another basic story of good business evil and who wins. Mm. Technically? Like, technically the camera and music are very good ma'am. Okay. The story is very mundane. Okay. The story is mundane but technic technically and who did the cinematography? I think Santosh Shivan. Rajiv. 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 that's a regular. Okay. Fine. Uh, we talk about authorism, right? So, uh, cinematographer and director, actor, the Arvind Swami comes back. Okay. Yeah, another f uh, feature of French New Wave uh, cinema was that they did not believe in a story and believed in improvisation on sets. So, traditional linear narrative structure, the classic linear structure was completely <coughs> demolished. Uh, and who were the people? What stories did they tell you about? And now think again Mean Streets and Bonnie and Clyde and Easy Riders. What are they? Okay. The stories about the young and the rebellious, the misfits, the alienated hero. These films use the language of the youth. Watch Godas Breathless and you will feel that some of the things he tells his girl. Okay, they were scandalous then and for some of us they are scandalous even today. <laughs> okay, and Breathless was made way back in 1960. So, using the language of the youth. Heavily influenced by popular culture. What do we understand by popular culture? I mean, I do not like the way people use the word culture very loosely, you know. This culture, North Indian culture, this this American culture, Western culture, what is culture? What is popular culture to be precise? Well, in common parlance, popular culture is used to refer to something that is not a uh, classic or that is not enjoyed by a certain elite, mm -hmm. something to that effect. So, popular culture say in cinema commonly refers to something like Bollywood or within India refers to the vernacular which is considered for the masses as opposed to a certain strata. Very nice. Now, see popular culture um, simplistically put <coughs> is that culture which is enjoyed by the masses, commonly accessible, easily accessible, 
So, we understand that R D Berman is accessible to most and Mozart is not, okay, that is the idea. So, um, same in Hollywood, rock and roll music accessible to most, whereas Beethoven would not, so, that is the idea. So, in these films, language of the youth, the street jargon as opposed to very uh, stilted kind of language that cinema uh, used at one point. Think Martin Scorsese again, think Easy Riders again, born to be wild, okay, that is the signature theme of the movie. Uh, and it, they are not using some classical <coughs> strain of music, they are unlike Renoir, who begins his movie with Mozart. So, Renoir is still meant for elites, for all his sympathy for the common people, but people like Godard, they broke away even from that. Hmm? So, extensive use of popular culture, especially popular Hollywood culture, featured existentialist themes that we will talk about and acceptance of the absur absurdity of human existence. Okay. So, most of these heroes think through false 400 blows, think Godas breathless, band of outsiders, a band apart. You know band apart is a movie by Godard and it, it has been immortalized by Tarantino as? Yes? His production house. His production house. Pro Quentin Tarantino's production house is called a band apart. Yeah. So, the characters in French New Wave films are often marginalized, anti-heroes, not conventional goody goody, goody two shoes heroes, loners. They betray no family ties, behave impulsively, spontaneously, immoral and amoral and are frequently seen as anti-authoritarian and all these features are found in uh, classic, uh, sorry, in uh, the counterculture Hollywood new wave cinema, extremely anti-authoritarian. Again think Bonnie and Clyde, again think Dog Day Afternoon, yes, anti-authoritarian written all over it, mean streets. Any other example? Easy Rider, of course, is a key text. And we were talking hell, uh, about Hell Ashby's Harold and Maud the other day. All these uh, uh, movies shake the foundations of a traditional way of thinking and attitudes and beliefs and morals. A general cynicism concerning politics, yes. Uh, there was a student revolution in 1968 in Paris. Are you aware of that? A student rebellion in the Parisian universities in 1968. Please look it up. Okay, it will it will uh, fine tune your understanding of this entire culture, culture cultural scenario. Um, Murakami, for instance, in Norwegian wood makes a reference to that incident. Please look at that, what is Parisian student rebellion. A deliberate distanciation between the screen and spectators, often breaking the fourth wall, Godas characters will start talking to us, okay, breaking the fourth wall. Otherwise, cinema is generally considered to be uh, <coughs> consisting of three walls, they know such thing as, they do not recognize. Why? Because they want us to become one with the proceedings on the screen. But when you break the fourth wall, you involve the audience in whatever is happening on screen and compel them to think rather than empathize and sympathize with characters. So, as Brecht rightly said that people should cry with brains and not with heart, that was what the French Nouvelle Vogue um, aspired to do. Any comments here? Any questions?
So, I am just giving you an overview of what French Nouvelle Vogue was uh, all about before moving on to Bresson. So, ask me questions please. Considered to be one of these movies. Paper Moon by Bogdanovich, yes, it should be, it's, it belongs to that, it is anti authoritarian, definitely. But, uh, the family ties were just. Absolutely, there is no such thing as a family ties in the movie. But, uh, she, um, she considers herself to be the daughter of the guy. But of the guy, okay, but that means you have the freedom to choose your own father. Yeah, you are not, you are not compelled to follow an uh, uh, authoritarian figure just because you are born in a particular family. So, rebellion against that uh, construct of family as well. She likes this guy and she says, okay, I want you to be my father figure and not anyone else. We are talking about paper moon. Uh, but also watch the last picture show, okay, Bogdanovich again. The same genre of yeah. WhatsApp doc. Yes. Is it also in the same genre of? It's in the same genre. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's a comedy. It's a reworking of Howard Hawks bringing up baby. Bringing up baby is a, a nerdy, geeky kind of a professor, a romance between a geeky professor played by Gary Grant and um, a light-hearted girl, uh, as played originally by Catherine Hepburn and in What's Up Dog by Barbara Streisand and it is a romance between the two of them. Love story, although based on a novel, is quite anti-authoritarian, right? Ma'am, the clear examples of new wave in French cinema and Hollywood cinema, how far do you think this sort of movement has happened in Indian cinema per se? Of course, we had uh, one uh, uh, Parallel cinema movement, okay, all those movies by Nehlani and uh, um, uh, Sham Benegal, okay. So, uh, do you remember those films? There is a movie called Nishant, okay, there is a movie called Manthan. Manthan is based on real people shot on location, uh, is based on uh, that entire dairy movement, Amul, yeah, and it is set in Gujarat shot on actual locations, mostly with uh, non-professional actors and all the greats who starred in Manthan later on uh, became pillars of uh, um, this art, art cinema in India, Nasiruddin Shah, Shabana Azmi, Smita Patil, uh, Girish Karnad, okay. But uh, uh, they were not that great <laughs> or they were not commercially successful actors when they were first featured in Manthan. So, Manthan is a landmark movie according to me. Before that, there was Nishant, okay, again by Sham Benegal, Saeed Mirza and he made a movie called Albert Pinto ko gussa kyu aata hai in Hindi. That means, why does Albert Pinto get angry all the time, angry young men, the original authentic angry young men. Of course, we have our more beloved angry young men, but let us not get into that, <laughs> okay. So, that angry young man remains, but Nasiruddin Shah was the angry young man in a couple of new wave kind of cinema, okay. And all these films uh, adhere to all the conventions of Italian neorealism and French Nouvelle Vogue. Like of course, now they are here and they are now, okay. So, of course, they are, I mean Love, Sex, Dhoka is a very good example. Um, Balki is a good combination of realism as well as commerce, okay. But then you have Santosh Sivan who I would call poetic realists, right. He makes quite realistic films, but um, uh, they are romantic, they are poetic in nature. So, I, uh, we had him uh, for one of our conferences and he spoke extensively about his style, his influences. So, one of these days I will show you the recording from that lecture. Uh, who else? Who else is? Uh, uh, extremely uh, Anurag Kashyap, yeah. So, his cinema is quite authentic, it's, it's, it speaks um, of the authentic people of India, okay. Very realistic, very, very much grounded in our uh, socio-political ethos. So, yes, 
and he often cast non-professional actors. I mean, you watch Gangs of Vasipur, except Manoj Bajpayee and uh, some of the actresses. None of them are recognized. I mean, Nawazuddin Siddiqui is big now, after that, all those movies. Yes, sir. and he was definitely not cast because of his looks, right? <laughs> or star aura, or whatever. Okay, so what did French Nouvelle Vogue cinema, what's the legacy? What did it give to us? A strong authorial voice. So everybody wanted to be an author for a very long time. Democratization of cinema, cinema about real people and about real events. So that's what we mean by democratization so of cinema. It's no longer a domain of the very elitist people speaking the language of the common people, starring people who, who were very average, who looked like common regular people and not the so called movie star. Okay. Um, from here we will move on to, you have something to say? No. no. Okay. We will move on to Robert Bresson and in particular I am going to discuss his film called Pickpocket. Do we have anyone here who is familiar with Pickpocket? Watched it. But heard of it. Good. Okay, Pickpocket is a classic. Ask me, one of the best films I have ever watched. Um, what is it all about? It's the hero is a pickpocket. Hmm? But true to French Nouvelle Vogue cinema, he is a very intellectual, very existentialist, inward looking, loner sort of a hero. Okay, and Bresson had uh, a far reaching influence on all these uh, uh, filmmakers, especially the uh, filmmakers of from the uh, Nouvelle Vogue and also um, uh, Hollywood New Wave cinema. Martin Scorsese, for example, Suez by Bresson, Taxi Driver, Robert De Niro character. There are several elements which are common to uh, the protagonist from Pickpocket and Travis Bickle's character. Okay, uh, just watch this scene, see uh, how much music does Bresson use. This is a scene as uh, it is a chapter in the metro. Hmm? So, uh, uh, just pay attention to his acting style, the protagonist, the hero's acting style. Okay. Uh, the narrative technique, the use of voiceover, music, and how the camera moves. Okay, so these are the things I want you to pay attention to. And uh, Paul Schrader has given commentary on this particular uh, movie. Paul Schrader is con you know who Paul Schrader is? Good screenwriter for Taxi Driver. Col frequent collaborator with, uh, uh, with Martin Scorsese, also worked with him on Raging Bull and uh, I guess The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay, so, Paul Schrader is Scorsese combination. Schrader is supposedly, um, was supposedly the intellectual among these new wave Hollywood directors and directors, the entire group and he has written a great seminal book delineating the works of Carl Dreher. You remember we talked about Dreher, Joan of the Ark, the Danish maker. Remember Joan of Ark, we were, when we were talking about modernists. Okay, so, we, I, I talked about Dreher, Carl Dreher and uh, the book focuses on the works of Dreher, Ozu, the Japanese master and Bresson. So, it is by Schrader. So, uh, Bresson 1907 to 99 made only 13 movies in a career which is uh, spanning 40 years and uh, uh, believed in necessarily casting non-professional actors whom he called models. Okay, actors are not nothing more than models, not our wooden models, but <laughs> actors who are models and uh, believed uh, in a dictate that art is transformation, it transforms you spiritually, intellectually. 
diary of a country priest, you can see a cross in the background and religion and spiritual, spirituality and uh, are common motives in his films. So, he considered the most Christian of all filmmakers, not in the narrow sense of the word, but in a more spiritual, more um, you know all encompassing sense of the term. Okay, so, you just watched a clipping from pickpocket, comment on it. The sounds are very realistic. Okay, the footsteps. Okay, good. Music, how much background music? Did you notice any background music? The hero is about <coughs> to pick somebody's pocket, right? Uh, generally, it would be accompanied with lot of thrilling kind of a music. Here, yeah, there is no music. He is just doing it as it is all in a day's work for him, no? Very regular. Anything else? The actions are really deliberate. Like when he puts the latch, when he <laughs> takes his jacket off and puts it on the hanger. The, the way he does it is a very deliberate sort of thing, like he, he does every meticulous. step. Yeah. He is a very meticulous person, the way he takes off his jacket at, at the end of the scene, uh, puts it up on a hanger, hangs it very meticulously, carefully up there, lives very sparingly in a room and surrounded with books. Okay. He is an intellectual, we are told he reads heavy books, very intellectual. Uh, French philosophy, Russian philosophy, that is what he did. Most of the time, we find him reading. When he picks somebody's pocket, he is holding a newspaper. Okay. Uh, what about acting? He is a non-professional. He was not a well-known actor to begin with. So, it was a deliberate attempt on Bresson's part to cast a non-professional actor. What effect does it lead to? Do we see lots of emotions and expressions on him? No. That is one technique that people like Dreher and Bresson employed very frequently that uh, make the actors rehearse so well. Firstly, cast non-professional actors because there, otherwise there would not be any sense of uh, lack of empathy. The moment you cast well-known actors, beloved actors, your sympathies are directly uh, automatically with them, no matter what role they enact. Yeah, Scarface, Al Pacino. Okay, so they, at that Al Pacino, whatever he does is good enough for us, right? But uh, the moment you cast a non-professional actor, what happens? You are forced to think about the events. Okay, you are not emotionally manipulated. So eschewing the use of actors, eschewing well known actors and stars, eschewing the use of music, but because what does background music generally do to us? Exactly, it leads our emotions, it dictates our emotions, it manipulates our emotions, right? Background music, especially the way it is used in our cinema. Okay, it tells us where to cry and where to laugh, right? And where to, we, you know, there is a certain kind of flute music playing and we know this is a love scene. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, the other day I was watching a movie, I would not tell, I would not tell you the title of the movie, it is a Hindi movie uh, with uh, a friend of mine and uh, the music starts playing and she nudges me and she says, you know what, it is a love scene, she is going to tell him that she loves him. Okay. I said, how do you know? She said, look, there are two things, there is music. Okay. For one, it is a moonlit night, secondly, and thirdly, and this is, boys pay attention to this, she is wearing a pink dress. So, everything falls in place and it happened the way, you know, and it is supposedly a more realistic kind of movie made by one of those. Uh, directors who prides himself on being not so conventional, but still there are certain tropes. But here, you do not know whether to empathize or sympathize or just to distance yourself. So, the idea is to distance yourself from the whatever is happening and just think what is happening. 
So, the director is not making any judgments, you make your own decisions or judgments about whatever is taking place on screen. So, pickpocket, Bresson is considered one of the most Christian of filmmakers whose style includes realism along with absolute ascetism. And if you watch this particular scene and you watch all his films, why just this particular scene? Uh, uh, you will fi uh, find that how all details are parted down, okay, very sparing, sp very extremely sparing use of all cinematic elements. And he believed that cinema is interior movement. His major works include The Angels of Sin, scripted with Jean Giraudoux. Giraudoux was a playwright, a French playwright of that period. The Ladies of the Bois de Boulogne, 1945, which, is, um, which was adopted uh, or adapted by Bresson along with Jean Cocteau. Remember, we were doing Cocteau. Beauty and the Beast, yes. So, Cocteau was another important artist, painter, writer, actor, film director, uh, playwright. Diary of a Country Priest is based on a novel by Georges uh, Bernano and tells a story of a young priest living in the countryside. So, a lot of spiritual religious elements. In the devil, Probably, Le Diable Problem, uh, he brought the theme of literal and figurative pollution. One of his last films, Pickpocket, starred uh, the actor you just saw, Martin, uh, Martin Lasalle and Marika Green. It is about a man who feels alive when he pickpockets. And is a pickpocket by choice. Okay, this is a, a vocation. This is a career. So therefore, when you you were quite on the mark when you observed that he did, does everything very meticulously. He is not forced to be a pickpocket. That's the only way he feels alive. So it's a very existentialist theme. You feel alive when you are doing some crime, when you are committing a sin. Otherwise, you are listless. You are dull emotionally. He does, he cannot feel connected to anyone unless and until he touches them in order to rob them and that is the only connection he feels with people. It is a wonderful movie, watch it uh, and lots of his themes. So, Bresson's uh, regular themes, frequent themes, the expression of spiritual interiority and also inferiority through concrete images and sounds. Very little dialogue, very little music, but uh, uh, real life sounds and very concrete images. His heroes, alienated, loners, misfits, extremely Dostoevskian and therefore, the uh, influence on De Niro and Scorsese in Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver is inspired by Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground. Uh, the direct, most direct influence on Bresson's pickpocket was Pick Up on South Street, a Hollywood film, 1953. Uh, pickpocket opens with a very uh, enigmatic caution. The style of the film is not that of a thriller. So, just because it is the story of a pickpocket, do not expect a thriller here. It is a very moral existentialist theme. So, that is that is a disclaimer that comes on screen. Michel, the actor, the hero, is an enigmatic in intellectual based on Dostoevsky's Raskolnikov in Raskolnikov is a famous character. 
crimes and crime and punishment, crime and punishment. He lives in a small room just like Raskolnikov, okay, surrounded with books, who a petty thief who pushes moral boundaries by indulging in picking pockets. Uh, in a way, it is a critique of capitalism because Michel often resists becoming a regular wage earner. People often tell him, you are uh, well read, you are quite educated, why do not you take up a job? And he says, I do not want to end up becoming somebody's slave or a regular wage earner. So, uh, pick, picking pockets definitely is not the only choice available to him. He makes that choice. Okay, he is not compelled to by that. So, what, what uh, uh, Bresson is discussing now here is free will versus coercive social forces. Society demands certain things, but this man wants to retain his free will and therefore, he chooses to become what he is. You may or you may not agree with him. He has a sick mother, so his family ties and he does not feel much attached to his mother. He has a saintly girlfriend who suffers and suffers because of him, but his uh, most satisfying human contact is made when he picks people's pockets. Again, Bresson's adherence to the principles of French New Wave, acting should be draining characters of emotions and that is what you feel when you look at his face drained of emotions. This is what Dreher also practiced and preached. Using non actors, avoidance of extreme close ups in order to dispense with oneness, with empathy, avoiding uh, music because he would not want to lead emotions, influence emotions, and use of voiceover. Did you notice that? Use of and very deadpan. Okay, it is not an emotional voice, he deadpans through it and a total rejection of melodrama. When mother dies, nothing happens. Okay. So, there is no background music, no tearful farewells, okay. mother just dies. And by bringing all these cinematic elements together, what does he try to achieve? He allows the audience a great deal of freedom to interpret the actions on screen. So, he does not lead you on. He does not tell you what to think or feel. He allows you to just watch certain concrete images and make up your own mind about that. So, um, this we have already seen and anti-authoritarian and misfits those characters and all these elements are found in Bresson's pickpocket. <coughs> Existentialist characters, yes of course. There is a famous montage when I, and I urge you that you watch the movie. And there is a famous montage which has been emulated uh, by several directors of picking pockets. Okay, so, a montage where the hero indulges in pickpocketing and that is something that all of you know that is a textbook kind of a montage scene. The, the movie finally raises moral questions, will we be judged and by what law, what law governs us? The legal or the man, laws ca created by man or more universal law. Uh, a clipping and this is just uh, a digression. There is a scene when uh, finally, uh, Michel is imprisoned and his lady love comes to visit him in the, in the prison and they talk to each other through this grill, the prison bar. And the same scene is replicated is by Scorsese. Remember Scorsese and Schrader combination and Schrader is a great follower of Bresson and so was Scorsese. And this is a scene from a New York anthology. Remember New York stories? It is a set of three films made by Scorsese's pieces Life Lessons starring Nick Nolte. The other two films in that anthology are by Coppola and Woody Allen. Okay, so, there is a, if you have not already watched that anthology, it is called New York Stories. Okay, so, this is a scene from New York Stories, where uh, Scorsese pays his homage to Bresson, 
replicates almost the same scene, Nick Nolte behind, a prisoner of his own self, a prisoner of his own creativity. He plays a painter. Uh, influence on Taxi Driver again, a combination, famous co collaboration between Scorsese and Paul Schrader, both admirers of Bresson, Taxi Driver 1976. So, following the same tradition, the same conventions as uh, Bresson did using a confessional narration, a voice over, a lonely alienated sociopath kind of a hero looking for a reason to live. The world for him is morally grey, dark, existentialist, absurdist almost, meaningless world and a voyeuristic look at the society. So, most of the time uh, you watch uh, pickpocket through Michelle's eyes and in Taxi Driver, it is De Niro's eyes. We were talking about close up of his eyes and most it is a voyeuristic gaze at the world outside. And Paul Schrader of course, happens to be a great admirer. So, uh, <coughs> we will be discussing Bresson tomorrow and if you have any questions, please bring them on tomorrow. Try to watch Pickpocket if possible. And we will be talking about Bresson's A Man Escaped in the next class. Thank you very much.